computer. Cool. So tonight we have three uh, very lovely guests from around the world joining us, uh, which is super exciting. Um, we are going to be having this conversation moderated by Danae, who's a, a wonderful collector currently based in Singapore, uh, joined by Kibam, who's a curator and gallerist in Los Angeles, and Marina, who is based in Puerto Rico, a curator. Um, and so they will be taking us into this conversation for about 45 minutes, and then we will uh, pause for a quick announcement and then open it up to questions uh, for the last 10 to 15 minutes. And we'll try to wrap up uh, within the hour. So uh, thank you all for joining us and take it away, Benet. You're mute. I think. There, I got, there, there you go. So good evening and good morning for me in Singapore. Um, thank you, Vincent, for having us, both Marina uh, and uh, Kibon. Thank you for sharing your time with us. Uh, so this talk is going to be about collecting, but collecting now. And uh, we cannot talk about collecting now without addressing uh, how the art world the past year and a half um has been um has been impacted uh, not only covid related but political unrest has been rampant this year social upheaval uh, and even social inequality um socioeconomical inequalities have been worldwide have suddenly taken a different relevance just think of what has happened uh with the um, rolling out of uh, vaccines in around the world and um and all those all those things that had happened have, have impacted our uh, the art market profoundly in many ways. Uh, so we have been challenging how we're collecting exhibit exhibiting policies or or uh, methodologies, um, historical mindsets that uh, have been ruling the art world. How we buy art uh, are today being socially contested. Um, and, um, and both Marina and Kibam are involved in projects that have been working before the pandemic on these matters, but today they take a huge relevance of what, we're, what they are doing. Um, so first we're gonna give a little bit of context with the first question. I'm gonna quote um, Cheryl Hall's um, paper, research paper that's called Whiteness as Property. Uh, and we will be applying the, it's based in the United States, but we will be applying a global pers perspective because all three of us consume in a way uh, art globally. And so um, we are thinking of, um, of this as a global phenomenon. Like my friend, uh, one of my friends says, uh, even, through, we, even though we can talk about specificities or localities, the colonial condition was a global condition. And as a consequence of that, white supremacy is a global condition. And when we talk about property, we're talking about the, conce the concept of owning art. So we're talking about property in reference to uh, art collecting as well. Uh, so how, where did it all start? Uh, how did we start putting art inside museums, inside galleries, inside hanging it from walls how did art and culture became something that can be owned by individuals and i'm going to quote cheryl hall on property indian property native american properties the property rights of native americans were communal communal and inhered in the tribe rather than an individual courts have been contended that native american people had not established possession of the lands that they claimed for. They also, although they had hunted and fished on the land, they have never enclosed it and allotted the land to individuals. That's key. The, the, so the concept of owning something, owning an artwork within an enclosure or allotted to one person, not, uh, as a, not a, as a, a community. So Marie, um, we can think that privilege and property share a common premise, which is the logic 
to the right to exclude mine from yours uh, when it, beforehand it was ours. Uh, inside or outside, but now we don't have inside and outside. Now we have global, we have online because everybody is in their own homes. Uh, so these are rules that have we have been uh, ha we have been working with in the art market, and today some of them are moot or irrelevant. So um, the mindset of the physical enclosed boundaries and the impulse to own preserve protect property and uh, art and culture within the confinement of a physical space as we know it we can think that the roots came from the colonial powers back in the day uh, so marina you as a curator of the tropical biennale the biennale tropical that has been conceived since its inception in at the beach and without walls in a way. Uh, so in your case, it was outside, correct? Um, how, how, from the beginning, how does a Biennale that doesn't have walls, that's in the beach, how did you, do you manage this historical mandate of what is worth, what we value has to be hanged in walls? Yeah, well, I think that that harks back to, um, I mean, like the inception of the museum or, or the com actually the, like the conversion of like royal um, collections in palaces being opened up to, to the public and, and the civilizing nature of like the civilizing effort that was related to that. So like when things were shown, when objects were shown, they were to display well, wealth and power and like the ability to accrue all these uh, all, all these objects and that is i mean that is obviously related to um, colonial expansion as well in our case the, the tropical biennial is a, a project that was founded by uh, pablo leon de la barra my like dear friend and, and colleague and it, it was at the invitation of another artist from puerto rico radames juni figueroa and it happened that the invitation came at a time when the, the scene in Puerto Rico was doing pretty badly, I would say. Um, it was right after the, um, uh, I mean, economic depression here started around 2006, really. But then came the, the compounded crises of uh, the financial crash. And then eventually a lot of commercial galleries uh, closed. So there were a lot of you know, commercial um, endeavors that were really affected by this, but also museums as well, um, because a lot of their funding was cut. So a lot of people found that there were just like not enough things to <laughs> to do, places to go. It just like the scene just wasn't fun, honestly. And Juni came up with the, the idea of establishing his own apartment um, gallery project. It wasn't really a commercial endeavor, but he... he he really um, explored the idea of using the internet as his, as his space. So events would happen in the apartment and eventually they would be put online and they would have a global audience. Um, but Paolo came on board at the end of the, of the cycle of the project. It was a one year project and he proposed to do an exhibition outdoors. So it is in a historically black town in Puerto Rico called Loisa. And it is uh, a show that is put up over one day. So you go, we go in the morning, uh, we set up, and then uh, you know the works eventually either remain or you know are, are destroyed or we dispose of them. I came on board in 2016 with Stefan Benchoam, another gallerist from uh, Proyecto Ultravioleta, and other artists that were also invited to be uh, like co-curators, like Bubu Negron, and. And then we really thought about like, okay, so this is a tropical biennial and we are in Loisa, we are visitors here as well. And we have to address uh, issues of representation, tropicality. Uh, we have to take, on, uh, to take on like more responsibility of the space that we're occupying and the artists, the local artists that we wanna be in relationship with. So there was a shift from the first tropical biennial to the second one, just to make it more truly site-specific. 
and consider issues of, uh, you know, from tourism to, yes, uh, tourism to like wider um, Caribbean representation. Uh, so there was like a kind of curated section and then uh, actually people just, we invited people to just show up and install their so, own work. I mean, I know from this Tropical Biennial, uh, amazing artists have been discovered. So what I want to ask, because this is something that we, I see, there's a huge parallel between what we are seeing today with the, the lack of uh, museum closed, the lack of, uh, of exhibition space, physical exhibition space uh, um, uh, with the lockdowns. Um, how, how did you, or, or think of how, kind of validating system because when they sell us works they tell us oh this museum bought this artist this museum so suddenly in the beach what what is the validating system how how can you convince someone to buy an artwork from oh i see there daniel's work um to buy a, an yeah. artwork that that is at the beach so there, there's no institutional you know background to this I, I would say that we can make up our you know our own institutional backbone of sorts. Like we validate each other, and that is why I think that Juni's uh, initial proposal for his project it was the apartment gallery project La Loseta. I think that's why it was successful because he was able to capitalize on his personal network of friends and colleagues all around the world to highlight specific artists and a specific scene in Puerto Rico. Uh, taking into account the, you know, just the power of the internet. And that's how it really circulated. Uh, th this is what a good friend of mine, another artist, uh, Guillermo Rodriguez, you know, calls doing it for the installation shot. <laughs> uh, so yeah, in our, in our case, it was, uh, a, it was more than that. It was definitely like we stretched out the, the biennial as well. We decided that we would have a video art night, um, a day of just like gathering, and it was we, we had a field trip to a to a beautiful river, uh, so we could you know share and uh, share together. And then there was just a, there was a party, uh, <laughs> there was a a day of just like pre production, and then on Saturday um, during that weekend, it was the weekend after um, Art Basel. That was also uh, Art Basel Miami. That was also important because everybody was going to be relatively close. I mean, everybody, mm. like the, some of the people involved, uh, uh, some supporters of the biennial as well, they, they could come over. Some artists that were already going to be there could come over. So it was convenient. Um, it wasn't market related, but it took the market into account. Um, exactly. Yeah. So it yeah, the system driven. It wasn't driven by it, but it, it, but it helped us in the end. Yeah, yeah. So, so one thing that I can, I can think of is uh, uh, fall, uh, like artists, uh, collectors just following trends. So, so when you engage with, with these kind of projects that are significant, relevant, that talk really to, to certain your values, your, uh, your wishes, your desires, uh, your reflections, um, keeping true to yourself engaging with this kind of projects is one of the things that we I think all three of us can can convene that this is something uh, um, we can agree on uh, and not follow maybe uh, or, or think be very aware of the mandates you have been receiving historically of what is good or what is bad what is worth or what is not worth it mm -hmm. uh, Kibam, in your case with Commonwealth and Council, Yang, you and your artist have developed a unique collaborator, collaborative sales system. Um, again, you, and it's funny because in your website you have us and you have we. It, in the, the, and I, today I was thinking of ours, mine, yours. Um, in this, we have seen this all year round. We have seen everybody trying to find a way of solidarity, selling art with solidarity in, in, within the com community um, driven. Um, and in a way you're challenging that original mandate of the right to exclude. 
you are up the the right to the uh, or the or challenging even the ownership of private property with this kind of uh, of uh, of sales uh, systems what prompted your decisions what were your worries in the gallery with the artist uh, why did this happen um let's see uh, thank you for having us um my name is kibum again and um uh, I, I'm, I'm right now in um, Koreatown, Los Angeles, like at our gallery space. Um, the building burned down partially at some point, obviously, in history. Um, but uh, it's interesting that Marina mentioned Zuni's project starting at an apartment because we're a gallery that was founded by an artist, Young Chung, and at his apartment on Commonwealth and Council Streets. Um, and currently, we, yeah, that's the apartment. It's building a great address. Where he still lives. Um, and, uh, you know, we, uh, we've always been led by the artists who've been part of Young's community that has grown and expanded over the years. And our direction and values are very much um, informed um, and anchored uh, by them, I would say. Uh, and, I, and that's our building that we're, I'm sitting in currently. Um, and I'd just like to give a brief, uh, Land acknowledgement that these are lands that have been stewarded by the Tongva people for generations um, prior to us. And I mean, it feels important to do so, particularly with the first kind of prompt or quote that um, Bene mentioned with Cheryl Harris's article, Whiteness is Property, and the kind of how our current conception of to own something, to have property stake in something, that notion of the right to exclude to if you pay for it and if you own it, then you can do whatever you want with it. It is yours. Um, I think that's a, a key kind of thing that we're trying to, I mean, maybe not overthrow necessarily, but to tweak to question. Um, and, you know, it's not something that like, 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 like we invented as Commonwealth and Council. I, I think in many ways, like uh, it has always been a part of the um, art world's conversation. So, you know, I think it's interesting that the, 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 the notion of taking care and the physical possession that the natives peoples had um, was characterized as stewardship by um, Cheryl Harris, because that in many ways is the kind of relationship that we try to underscore when we, well, so like, I mean, you know, and, and like it, it ref, it's reflected in the language we use in the art world too, right? So instead of selling artwork, we often use the word, we place the artworks, you know? Um, and we kind of obfuscate or bypass these uh, 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 the, uh, uh, vocabulary of transactions. Um, and that really is in many ways to try to promote and honor this kind of ongoing responsibility and ongoing relationship that this exchange um, uh, commemorates. Uh, so um, that's why it's like, you know, um, you know, we, we have precedents for moral rights, which started out in France and um, par parts of which we uh, have uh, as federal law in the US since the early 90s. So, you know, even it, it kind of bucks against our notions of property rights as in, if you buy, bought something and if you own it, then if you wanna like, you know, if you buy a house or a car, you can paint it hot pink the next day if you want to. You can like chop it in half if you want to. You can build a second or third floor if you want to. But with artwork, we have this notion of like, no, like the artist, the creator is still tied to these works. And we have to um, consider their interests and their intent and their dignity in how we take care of these works. So it's this like on the, the, the ongoing nature of responsibility. Um, is I think key thing. And I think that's what the, the word stewardship really connotes. Um, and that's something that we have, you know, we've always felt when we, you know, like artists put a lot of care and time and effort and a lot of them really become attached to the works they make, they're their baby. So, you know, they don't like it when works just leave their studio and go to some fancy mm. how never to be seen again. And mm. so I think that's the kind of the, 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 this, this notion of exclusion that Bene was referring to. And so we've always, yeah. like, it's always been important for us to have these conversations and you know, a lot of our supporters, including Bene have been very generous about like loaning works for museum shows so that the larger public can see them. 
even if that means they're not really living with them that much. Um, actually, if you're in Chicago, one of our artists who's probably most notorious for doing this, Carlina Caicedo, has a big show, beautiful show up. Um, and in Alana Chicago, in the MCA, yeah. Yeah, some of, some of the works there, you know, we have placed four years ago, and they've literally been traveling the entire time from show to show. So um, that kind of continued, yeah. continued relationship. It's, it's almost like continue, yeah, the agency of the artist. Yeah, continuing yeah, the, yeah. yeah, it's a responsibility. And, uh, but uh, Kibam, uh, I, I mean, I, I like the way, because one of the things that I do as a collector all the time is like art, for me, artists are my leaders. So I always ask, ask artists what, like when I go to an art, uh, an art fair that night, I say, what did you like? to the artist and why. And I almost, sometimes I even wor uh, wor walk um, the art fairs with them. Uh, but there's something about collecting about our system that is key, which is uh, trust. Uh, I, th I have to trust you, you have to trust me. The artist is entrusting you with, the, uh, with almost their soul. So let's talk about what you did because you made uh, in common one Art council you you made a a, a truck a, a pact of a, a contract of trust with your artists yeah. Okay. yeah so um yes so 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 yeah so sorry that was like a long wind up but um so no, no, that's to, say, okay. <laughs> to say like we've been thinking about these like is issues for a long time in running the gallery uh but then over the past year through COVID, um, you know, when it felt like the world stopped back in like, I mean, I guess like exactly a year ago, we started having these weekly Zooms with the artists and just talking about like checking in on each other, um, just shooting the shit. But then also, you know, it happened to be our, the, the, the 10 year anniversary of the gallery from when, when Young started in his apartment. So, you know, in many ways, like we have, grown and done way more than what the founders could have ever imagined. But how do we want to survive and thrive and grow from here? And the thing that, that, that the main thrust that kept coming up was like, we want to make sure that we make it out of this together, this kind of notion of collective, mm -hmm. well, mutual care and also just collective rising. So, you know, how the art world works is like, it often like anoints stars who gain, get a lion's share of the attention and the, uh, you know, financial and kind of clout success. Um, and, you know, we have over 30 artists uh, that we represent in our gallery now, and they are such fans of each other's work and they wanted to make sure that um, everyone partakes, participates in some of the success. So, we started two concrete initiatives. One, one, one part we call we call the trust, um, and that is the artists. And it's not like required, but the artists who wish to participate in this trust contribute artworks of like what is now kind of a similar value, and they will stay together. And years from now, when some of these you know might be worth a lot of money, we would be able to place them and. Uh, the, the profits would be shared equally. So that's kind of like mm -hmm. an attempt at a retirement plan of sorts, which a lot of artists don't have, you know, financial mm -hmm. and practical stability is not, <laughs> if that's what you want, being an artist, yeah. this is probably not the yeah. thing for you. But, um, no, and, and, then these, the other, and this brings, uh, yeah, yeah, go, go ahead, sorry. And, and, and then the other kind of piece was um, what we're calling the council fund. Um, and so for more immediate needs, um, we, because, because, you know, there have been a couple like medical emergencies, artists, artists have gone through in the past year. Uh, and, you know, uh, uh, our, our artists are exploring more and more kind of public facing, more like intervention, performative type of works that don't really have much of a market. So in order to be, a, and, you know, they, they also usually tend to, uh, tend to be the most expensive works to produce, like In Plain Sight, which was by Rafa Esparza and Castles, where they um, sky typed messages protesting uh, migrant detention. Um, uh, that phrase that you see flown over Los Angeles uh, is uh, Care Not Cages by Patrice Collars, one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter. Um, 
So in order to support these kinds of things that don't necessarily fall within the capacity or traditional responsibility of the gallery, we decided to start this kind of like fundraising initiative. And for that, we are speaking with our patrons, so collectors and museums that buy works from us. And speaking about, that's from our some, one of our summer Zooms. Um, uh, and we're, we're, we, we are at asking them, it's like, you know, um, you've been a great client of the space. So traditionally we give you like extend a 15% discount. Would you be willing to forego all or part of that to contribute to this collective fund? to give the artist this age, um, more, uh, more agency in, and, and one of the things that like, and we, we started this, unroll this in October and we just kind of cleared the mark where we would be able to perhaps pay for insurance for half of our artists who don't have health insurance at the moment. You know, it's kind of like a human right, but you know, just the, the way that mm -hmm. our account is set up and, um, yeah just for kind of freelance kinds of workers like artists uh it's been very difficult so this is the, these are the, the 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 council fund and the trust are two initiatives that we started over the past year and this comes to to what what has happened uh with during covid but but also when you engage with a gallery as a collector i i at least the one of the questions that they asked us is how to re collect responsibly and one of them is, is actually this, understanding that the art is market is an art ecosystem, that there's a lot of workers that, that many don't have retirement, fund, retirement funds. Many of the artists producing around the world, they don't have a public health system that works uh, and they, don't have, they cannot afford private, uh, private health care. Uh, so, so, and many, institutions around the world have been tackling this this there's something that's horrible that's some, I, I mean some emerging museum uh, professional uh, websites and someone says do we have to come from a wealthy family to be able to be an art worker so basically you have to work for free <laughs> Uh, many of us, I mean, it's not my case, but many of, of the people I engage with have like three, four works, jobs, because they cannot make ends meet with one. So one way of ensuring that you're collecting um, socially con commit committed when you're collecting is understanding, uh, trying to understand if the institution you're buying from is uh, socially uh, engage in these matters and uh, treating their artists, their workers uh, um, responsibly. So let's go to our second question. So we have established that private property, as we know it, or um, is not a natural right in a way. It's a social construction. So we have been uh, working on the premises that that this is something that cannot be contested, but it actually can. Um, and today, for me, as you said, Kibam, the difficulty doesn't lie in identify or or Marina. To you, you mentioned this, identifying which expectations we have on property, but which new expectations are reasonable. So you opened something new, Marina, but understanding that you had our Basel next to you, uh, we are not debunking a system. Uh, so, Kibam, evidently we have to have, uh, we cannot undo what we, what, what we have, uh, we, this is the, the art market we have. Um, so, um, within uh, this reality, the reality we have today, which would be reasonable for the future, the near and the, the long-term future, uh, reasonable challenging and questioning lines in terms of buying, selling, owning, do you think we should tackle? Um, any commercial practices we need to, to rethink? Um, I, I'm, I'm talking worldwide, okay? After what we've been through, how, what, what are your hopes in a way? Um, I mean, this is kind of like general, but actually like, like yeah, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna touch upon what you've mentioned a couple of times is the art world is an ecosystem and all of the players, including the three of us here, a curator, a gallerist and collector, patron, um, we play a part in giving opportunities and platforms to artists and helping them help, you know, get them validation in the art world for whatever that's worth. 
um, and hopefully that translates into like livelihood and getting their work seen by more folks. Um, but I think oftentimes the way that, particularly in really like the past couple of decades in which the art market and particularly the contemporary art market has grown at a very, very, very fast rate. Um, there's this like script to really build that kind of demand and um, to make the pitch based on these institutional validating factors. Like, um, you know, like, I mean, yeah, like our, some, some of our clients ask and when friends are asking about like other artists that are seeing things like, oh, like, what museum shows do they have coming up? Like what collections are there? in? and, you know, like, I mean, it's, it's not irrelevant or, uh, you know, we, we, <laughs> we love getting our artists when, when our artists get those kinds of like accolades too. But, um, I think relying more on just like your, your, your heart and your, your intuition and like how the work speaks to you and how the artist practice, um, speaks to you and supporting those things and looking at the long run. I think if you do that, like, you will never go wrong, you know, because if you really love something and you look at it uh, in your in your in your living room 20 years later, I think it will still it's likely to have more staying power than something that like at the moment is like, oh, my God, everyone has to have this it bag or like now, like we have to have this like artist, you know, there's a wait list of 100 people. So like I must be missing <laughs> something. Um, and like that, that kind of, and that, that, that sort of like cycles of like trends have been getting accelerated more and more. Um, uh, and, you know, particularly for artists, like it's not like a fashion brand. So when you ride that trend cycle, like on the way down, it can be a really treacherous role to kind of pick up the pieces and rebuild your career. So I think just like really, really perhaps just, I mean, not, not again, like not like overthrowing, but like just just like tweaking the script a little bit about the kinds of conversations we have and um, how, 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 how we approach and learn about art and collect. Yeah. I would love to see. You they know. should be significant and relevant to you, basically, yeah. to yeah. what you, your agency and the, and the ethos of your, the gallery and the, yeah, one of the things that I always say to everybody that asks me, there is not one way or collecting or a wrong way of buying art. It is a personal journey. It is what triggers you. And the reason behind collecting are yours. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, uh, I, I, don't be, I, I'm, be unapologetic about what you like and, yeah. and try. It's true that the script, the follow trends, it's hard to, it's hard to fall, to open, to be a trendsetter in a way, to open your own trend. Um, and Marina, also, and, um, and I, no, I, I, yes. I just wanted to jump on, on, on that and say that, um, like trends can also be very detrimental to artists in the future. Like if, if, if prices are, you know, off the charts, they can also crash if there is not a sustained support for their artists. And uh, yeah, I, I just think or, that or a, not a, maybe a, not a sustained, but a significant or a validated in terms of like career maturity, aesthetic, aesthetic value. So suddenly, because it's a trend, everybody's consuming certain art goes to skyrockets, they burn. And it, it, it's really not a journey with 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 the quality of the production. You're yeah. I, and I have this conversation with a lot of galleries because sometimes I get very upset you have a responsibility uh, to take care to not raise prices like crazy just because people are you have a huge demand uh, Marina now that physical exhibition spaces have been moved for more than a year we don't have the walls now in a way and the brick and mortar institutions are as cultural containers are scrambling to find new meanings all of us we're trying in the art world are trying to find new meanings what do you think reasonable new exhibition formulas can be for our be for our future? And uh, and one two questions I, I I'd like you to address are one is that uh, is it going to be uh, uh, is this the time for public art to for outside art in a way or urban art? And the other is the what has happened with access to art this year with the online or with the free online in a way. Um, were um, trends that we are seeing? Well, 
I, I, I work at a museum <laughs> here in Puerto Rico. It's the Museum of Contemporary Art. And I can speak from, from that experience and from uh, projects that I've seen pop up both online and, and here. I think that uh, at least locally, I think that we have a great ability to bounce back whatever happens because we've had shows since like summer of last year. Uh, so we've been like the my museum reopened in September. Other museums opened, I think, in July, and other exhibition spaces, independent exhibition spaces, have been, um, you know, working within their own restrictions of space and whatever uh, the the executive orders at the, were at the time. So nothing has been illegal, <laughs> but we, we've been trying to get, I mean, not trying to gather, but yes, like not, not letting, not completely letting go of the idea of holding, um, you know, physical exhibitions, like exhibitions in the physical space. However, um, we have, act, I, our museum also has a lot of um, commissions that are done outside of the museum. This is a program that's been going on for, uh over six years now so we do a lot of not necessarily it, it's not necessarily public art um commissions not all of them are but they are done um in the community in different communities around puerto rico so they might be murals or dance pieces or performance events um, or maybe just the research part of the project is being done in conjunction with, you know, another um, maybe like human rights organization or an environmental uh, organization. So they serve as uh, as connectors between artists and different communities. I, I would say in particular coastal communities uh, around um, around Puerto Rico. So this is not something that has been completely foreign to us and we were able to you know stay kind of sort of on track in terms of our um year like year-long annual commitments uh both in exhibitions and uh and off-site commissions so that's something that really drew me into what the, into the work that, that the museum has been doing it's like community connect connections to different communities around the island um, trying to bring the museum to them and not necessarily expect people that might not understand or be intimidated by um, you know, a, a big building <laughs> in, in general. Uh, so there's a lot of like self exclusion from art spaces as well. So we try to bridge that gap a lot with the work that the museum does in education and with these upside commissions. But I have to say that I really liked, um, well, We've we've also partnered uh, with with Google for the for a lot of their art camera um, projects, and and that's like another way in which we were able to expand our online offering. So we spent like over a month photographing works, um, sharing them online, inviting other other curators like Natalia Viera, uh, 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 works at the America Society, or Marilyn Ortiz, who works at PAM in Miami to take another look at the collection um, and choose works and contextualize our works with other works that are available on, on the platform on Google Arts and Culture. Um, but so, I, I think so, that's the general so, way. So relevance, relevance, connection, uh, reflection, um, it, it's community. Very, it's very important that people also uh, see themselves in what we collect in the museum. Uh, so Sense I think that's ownership. what that that is. Yes, that I am. I, that is one of the things that we've been really like taking a hard look at. Mm. Uh, and, well, and it's interesting like, how because we can, the, how we can expand it. The museum from uh, actually a container, uh, uh, almost like um, uh, you know Tupperware, where no, nothing went. The, the the you know it went. The cultural production came from inside and out, outside, but nothing came in. Now it's the opposite formula. We're looking at the museum being permeated and cross-pollinating by uh, community, 
uh, but their communities uh, or social responsibility. Now, yeah. both of them, before we go to the third question, both you have um, talked about uh, non-commercial artworks, correct? That we cannot consume. And I have been, unfortunately, with, with second, so if, no, I don't know if everybody knows, but secondary market is when an art, when you buy an artwork and you can sell it, sec, you sell it for the second time. So for example, today, video artwork doesn't really have a secondary market. Performances doesn't have, don't have. So we want, I mean, most of us buy for passion, but we also have a financial responsibility. We've talked about this kebab a lot. Um, so, so how do we go? Because I see that more and more artworks, that more and more artworks, and they are the ones that are exciting me most, are the ones that have no commercial value in a way or no secondary market. Like you were saying, Marina, the follow, you know, the camera artist. Uh, so, so what do we do? How do we engage with this? I mean, that's where the notion of patronage, I think, is very important. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, frankly, yeah, we have a lot of artists who do these more difficult, ephemeral, time-based media performance video kind of art. And, you know, we have placed their work, but their, their, their audience for placement is almost exclusively museums because, you know, they feel as like the stewards of art history they should be collecting these works, which, you know, hopefully are representative of the time that we're in. Um, but no, like you can't like hang it on your wall as a trophy, you know, um, <laughs> and uh, it's, but, but, but like to say is like, I, I, I do think like this is where also that notion of sometimes the most radical difficult thing is like what will pay off the most, you know, because you look at Felix Gonzalez Torres's work, you know, um, a light string that you can order from Amazon for $20 goes for like, what is it like five, six million now. Um, and okay. it's such a beautiful elegiac work about kind of death, the ephemerality of life, um, particularly going through the AIDS crisis that he lived through um, this Cuban American queer artist. Um, but, you know, like when that was work was first being shown in the 90s, like it's not like people were like tripping over themselves to try to buy it, you know? Um, well, so uh, yeah, what it, I think that what excites me the most at this time, because we, it, it's also ideas, correct? Yeah, it's yeah. The, the, the new ways of seeing. So, for example, we have seen like on and on works on historical relevance. On, on slavery around the world, but nobody's talking about slaves of today. Yeah, no, you no, know, I mean, which are the artists who are seeing slavery from a different perspective, yeah, for example? You know, yeah, no, and like, I would just like, um, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try a couple of moves here. Um, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, firstly, I think, I think just like, 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 like trying to support these artist projects and kind of going out on a limb once in a while. You know, it doesn't have to be the bulk of your collection, but and supporting works and you know uh, 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 owning something, uh, acquiring something into your collection um, that is more challenging. I think could be uh, really meaningful. And it's not just about the money, but it's such like a moral encouragement to the artist too. Um, at times when these works are. Uh, mm. uh, uh, um, join particular, you know, institutional collections and are shared with other folks. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah, uh, Vincent, can, can, can we show images of Carolina's work a little bit? So it's interesting, um, we have uh, in the gallery right now, we have a show up by Carolina Caicedo. Um, she was born in London, but of uh, Colombian heritage. A lot of her work has kind of um, uh, 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 been inspired by her work as an activist. Um, and if you scroll down a little bit, um, she has this body of work that <laughs> Marina and I were talking about earlier, where she took these bond certificates from three different commonwealths, um, Puerto Rico, uh, the state of Virginia, and the state of Pennsylvania in the US. Sorry, it's a little further down. Um, and so these are financial certificates that 
you know, to, for, for fundraising for these like public infrastructure projects and such. And that oftentimes have resulted in places like Puerto Rico's economy has been wrecked by how indebted it is, right? Um, but, um, and this is like speaking purely to the finance system and capitalism. Um, and so, the, the, but like the, the, the word bond or like the word trust, you know, these, these kinds of vocabulary used in finance kind of have these like sort of like, like, like feel good uh, 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 connotations. Um, Just like come on, the, um, yeah, and yeah, and 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 yeah, exactly. And 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 one of the the, the things that that um, Carolina found out was that um, uh, the word bond comes from um, the U.S. The collateral for these debts were slaves, slave bodies. Oh. So bond is short for bondage. So you can see like, you know, in some certificates you have like black laborers working sugarcane fields. Um, and that kind of like, like the notion of labor and people's bodies being um, considered chattel property, um, but also being traded in this manner, something that um, we speak to and I think, um, uh, like it's it's that's why it's like it's, it's it's this is the kind of work that I think art can do is to 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 reveal these kinds of histories and present it in um, a manner that we can reflect on in different ways, and um, yeah, and change yeah, and change collective thought in a way or like the turning point where you understand something you have never seen before. Um, even though Carolina is now grounded to to a physical work in in this case, he was she was able to connect the idea with actu an actual uh, object. Um, I do believe that we are seeing a lot in the market now a lot of works that have been have gotten out of the physical space and are more connected. So have gone out of the the building in a way. Yeah. And if I can make just like yeah one more brief comment, I know I'm like kind yeah, of like, yeah, yeah, thinking, yeah. But to kind of like, but but like I'm like we so we've been thinking a lot about these kinds of like 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 how things are financed, how our market systems and notions of like financing and capitalism and growth and have been um, structured and how art fits into all of that, and something to 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 go to the meat of your question about like performance art and things like that, how can they be supported? It's we're really. Um, living through a very interesting moment. Um, I'm going to throw out a, a, a dirty word right now, um, and I don't want to go down the rabbit hole, but NFTs. So oh. it's interesting because <laughs> these, but, 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 but NFTs are actually an instrument that could potentially provide a market where artists making this kind of difficult work like performance or more conceptual work could develop a market. The unfortunate thing is everyone's just obsessed with like the secondary market trading and how much like record-breaking multi-million dollar results that these uh you know jpegs are generating but mm. i mean i do think like this is a very exciting catalytic fertile moment because we the, 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 these new um technologies of sorts are mm, presenting yeah. different notions of how art can exist, circulate, be traded, you know. Yeah, owned, yeah. It, 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 even it. though many of us we're still we're still uh, we're still struggling with with what with this uh, phenomenon uh, that you can change, like go to Financial Times. It, it's I mean it's on online. Uh, what has happened? Uh, I think definitely it has opened the door to new a new uh, sales uh, commercializing mechanic that we didn't have before. The last yeah. question, and we're gonna go like this um, with it before. Yeah, yeah, Marina. Go just ahead. one thing. Yeah. I um, so what's I think what's interesting about the possibilities that are opened up by by the blockchain is precisely that the originator of the of the work can trace where the like who owns it and can make money all along like that chain of exchanges um yeah it's just a matter of 
I mean, the certificate of authenticity could be on the blockchain is what yeah. I mean. Yeah. So yeah. it would be a yeah. way of, instead of a JPEG or a GIF of, you know, the cat with the body of a, what was it? Like a, <laughs> a Pop-Tart uh, with the head of a cat instead of yeah. Nyan cat. You know, we could we could have a certificate of authenticity that whenever exchange that whenever it exchanges hands, <laughs> uh, the work exchanges hands on the blockchain. Like it it would have a trail. It would be verifiable. You would know that it is authentic, and the artist would make money um, throughout the, yeah. the, yeah. the transactions. Yeah. So I think that is so important in 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 the long run you mean uh, yeah in the long run and because a lot of artists you know they don't they don't make money when the work is resold unless it is built into mm. contracts yes yes and or, or unless the country has a drought the sweet uh laws uh, not that not all of them have yeah. um and so so one thing to go really uh, into a, a thing that I have been, been worrying me, and we've talked about a little bit of trends, trends around the world. Are we consuming art uh, as a positive, um, as a po uh, not positive, yeah, so um, affirmative action? Uh, um, I don't know, gesture. Uh, are we? How to? I mean, how to avoid that? Because. I don't want to be consumed as a collector because I'm a woman, because I'm Latina. Uh, I, I want to be consumed for who I am as a human being. So how do we avoid tokenism, self-exotization, uh, or even these now trends that we, ha we have seen? Uh, we have seen museums run like, like crazy now trying to see what are their, how many women they have in their collection. And now buying new women so um, I think maybe Kibom, you can talk from the commercial side and uh, Marina from the institutional side. Um, Marina, you want to start? Yeah. Um, well, in, in our very particular case where I, where I work, we have a mandate to collect art from Puerto Rico, its diasporas, the Caribbean and Latin America. That is huge. <laughs> uh, and but I, that's connected to your locality and your mission. Yes, yes. So it is. Yes. Yes. But, um, but I would say that it is also connected very much to the group of people that founded the museum, which included a lot of um, uh, artists that were in exile in Puerto Rico from other parts of Latin America, particularly Cuba and, and Chile, people who are escape, like, escaping the Pinochet dictatorship. Uh, or maybe second generation Cubans, et cetera. Uh, so there was that presence in the collection from the beginning, but not necessarily something that was able to be sustained throughout the history of the museum, just because of you know, just financial issues or um, maybe a, a, a lack of sustained connection with different art scenes around the region. Uh, I'd like to think that that's one of the reasons why I was, you know, brought into the into the museum to try to like, expand those relationships. Um, so, <laughs> having said that, I I I think I address tokenism head on. Like uh, part of my work and my and my recent research has been about tropicality, the ideas of paradise and fiscal paradise in the particularly around the Caribbean. Um, resignification of spaces for tourism so you know what used to be a plantation is a resort literally the people like the descendants of the people who work the plantation are working in the resort and that happens throughout the the caribbean or maybe it used to be a military space that was converted into a, a natural reserve now and it's thought of as beautiful but when you dig up you know dig a little deeper it there's still bombs unexploded bombs and and those you know and that military history has shaped the landscape so i try to bring all these things that really bother me about history and about um, our economic precedent as well or you know neo-colonial relationships that that exist into my work 
so instead of rejecting certain um instead of like plainly rejecting certain stereotypes i'm like you know let's let's work with artists who contest these histories or who try to propose you know counter narratives or try to say well if, if our recent history you know of uh, from the mid 20th century to the present has been shaped by uh, you know tourism campaigns what is our culture how can we you know maybe we can make up mm -hmm. some kind of you know science fiction about what our identity is you know, so there's there's people that are actively addressing this whether it's working with archives or working from the you know borderline like unexplained <laughs> phenomena uh, so those are the yeah, kind of so, artists so that I like to work with. The three of us are connecting a lot to context, to 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 meaning, to how relevant or significant we're not. We're not even. We haven't even talked about icon iconography or uh, images. We ne We actually in the whole scope, we've been talking about meaning in a way. So one of the things that I think. Uh, can be a way of, of uh, re reparation in a way uh, of uh, unrepresented uh, artists is the connecting through actual meaning. Kibam, what do you say to a collector that comes and say, I want to buy a black artist? <laughs> what, what do you, how do you convince people who want art and say, okay, now I feel the responsibility, the so specific duty to buy a black artist, or I, I want to buy more women in my collection. So how do you convince them? Tell me what you do with that, collecting like that. Yeah, and then maybe after mm -hmm. we'll wrap it up there, because <laughs> I think that that's a yeah. good question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like I, yeah, like I, yeah, like like this is this is this this question alone could be a five-hour conversation. <laughs> okay, briefly. but you have one yeah, minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll just speak very briefly. Um, yeah, I think I think it's. I, I would just like to say that the big picture thing is. I mean, I think it's very important to have um, greater. Uh, 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 representation to speak, you know, to, 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 to wake up to and reflect on systemic inequities and all think about how we can do our individual and collective parts to, um, to, to, to address and fix it. Um, but, you know, oftentimes I think the, 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 and we already went through this in the nineties with like the identity politics, um, 1.0, right. Um, and, the easiest way is to do some grand gesture kind of thing and um, you know think just about like numbers and that's where I think a lot of like um, tokenizing kind of rhetoric and actions have sprung out of and part of the thing that's really been uncomfortable for myself personally to witness is like there is a lot of enthusiasm and goodwill about um, uplifting a lot of black and brown, um, you know, queer artists at the moment, female artists at the moment. But um, it, it feels like it, there's so much market heat and it's translated into a lot of this kind of like um, trend-based collecting. And that has also made it feel like woke consumerism in a way, you know, buying a painting of a black body rendered on canvas like does not absolve one of their white privilege and guilt um and i think again the context is important so your own kind of resonance and relationship and commitment to that work and the artist and also knowing that there's a difference between that piece hanging on a you know a well, I'm in LA, so like a wealthy person's like Bel Air huge house, um, opposed to a, um, and even for public museums too, is like what audiences and are they speaking to, you know, who has access to see these works? What is the kind of community engagement and public education that is being offered um, online, offline, otherwise? I think. It's, 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 it's a much more thorny, complicated, mm. nuanced kind of thing. There is no black and white way to say like, this is the right way and that's the wrong way. But no. I think something that we should all acknowledge is that we live, like the air we breathe is permeated with these kinds of systemic inequalities, you know? 
So oftentimes, like even the way we way that the art world is structured, that doesn't have like this like explicit uh, 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 racialized aspect or something. Like David was talking, asked a question earlier about like how galleries are really um, opaque about prices. So, you know, the fact that things have been online and a lot of galleries are putting up prices, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think it's kind of a good thing because there's so many like institutionalized ways of keeping, trying to keep a lot of people feel alienated and intimidated in the art world. And that oftentimes most directly impacts those that most marginalized socioeconomically, racially, and otherwise. So just kind of like being a bit more like open-minded to self-criticality um, and, and, mm. and and changing things in, in whatever capacity we can, um, I think would be very meaningful. I, 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 so I, I also, up, yeah, oh, sorry, uh, Marina, go, go no, ahead, no, no, go ahead. just, yeah, just, just saying that, uh, I, I think that there is a lot of generosity that has sprung up, you know, in not only uh, generosity in, in terms of, you know, charity or grants, etc., but also in the way that we have, that we've become more open about the not, not just like transparency in prices but also just like there is a necessity to be more open about the the meaning the content or the or the the context uh and and different interpretations of works because we want to appeal to different audiences uh, in in my case i want people that visit uh the show that i curated to know you know who the artist is, what uh, what kind of um, uh, work they do in general, and then I'll speak specifically about this piece and how it relates to others that are in the in the same gallery space. Because I want I don't want people to feel the need to have to have someone else like a, a docent or someone else in the room telling them what things are, you know. So there can be more autonomy in how they relate to the to the work, and also you know. They can have their own interpretations, but there is this, you know, this information that I'm going to give you so that you have all the tools to, to appreciate and, and take away from, from these works. Okay, so to wrap it up, uh, collecting now, it's not anymore buying one of, uh, uh, for an individual buying one work. It is very clear that is a social exercise, a political exercise uh, all around the world. And I don't think, I hope we don't leave that trend uh, and we at least, you know, uh, make it grow. Uh, being said, thank you so much. Thank um, you all. This was really wonderful. I know we could have this conversation for hours and hopefully one day we get to. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for coming. My name is Vincent Uribe. I'm the Director of Exhibitions and External Relations for Arts of Life, which is a nonprofit art studio supporting adult artists with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We promote their professional practice as artists. And we're excited to have our Art of the Heist Benefit next Thursday, which is an art auction raffle um, featuring artists from our studio, as well as artists from across the country who have donated works to this event. Uh, it is free for anybody to attend. We're going to have entertainment from across the country. Uh, and we, we invite you all to tune in uh, and participate in our event next Thursday. And we're, we're so grateful that you all to join us tonight on a Thursday after a long day of work and everyone's different hours from where they're at. So uh, just thank you again for joining us. I appreciate your, your thoughts. And I think we we answered mo a lot of the questions that came in through the chat. So we'll, we'll wrap it up there too. So again, thanks everybody for joining. Thank you. Thank you.